Washington Journal continues. Warren Farrell is our guest. He is the co-author of a book called The Boy Crisis, also serves as the chair to commission to create a White House Council on Boys to Men. Good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, when you say crisis, how do you define that? I'm, uh, that's a very high bar for me. I don't like words like that. So um, boys are doing badly in every single academic subject, um, including reading and writing, which are the biggest predictors of success in all 56 of the largest developed nations in the world. But boys are doing especially badly here in the United States. Um, there's not a good preparation for boys who are more, less academically inclined. Vocational education has been cut back. So boys are often dropping out of high school, become discipline problems. They have no sense of purpose. Uh, they start getting into drugs. And then um, when they drop out of high school, more than 20% are unemployed in their early 20s, which is five times the national average. And so boys are doing very badly mental health-wise. Uh, the suicide rate for boys and girls at the age of nine is equal. But between the ages of 10 and 14, it becomes twice as much for boys. Between 15 and 19, four times as much for boys. Between 20 and 24, five times as much for boys. And so um, in the... Uh, you don't see those type of trends amongst girls then as well, or this is specifically that, a boy issue. This is a boy issue. Actually, boys' life expectancy has for the first time gone down. Girls has remained the same. So girls' life expectancy isn't doing as well as we want either. But what I found is that I started looking, what's the common denominator of all the developed nations? And the developed nations allow permission for two things, for divorce and for being able to have children raised um, without dads. And the boy crisis, I found, basically resides where fathers do not reside. So as far as when did you think this was, uh, when did you get a sense of this was a, a problem? When, when was this a, an emergency uh, or a concern of you? Yeah, one of my previous book tours, I was, I was getting um, Japanese um, teachers coming up to me and saying, you know, I'm having more problems with boys in my class than the girls. Canada, Australia, the United States, I was getting the same types of questions, especially from mothers and teachers, but teachers were seeing it in the larger picture. Um, you know, schools were saying, you know, most of our um, honor students and our honor society are g girls, not boys. Um, and then, but people were saying, well, you know, boys are still, you know, largely the, the heads of uh, companies and things like this, so what's the big problem? But boys were also the great majority of the homeless, the great majority of the people dying from drug overdoses and opioid crises. And so, um, yes, males were sort of a certain percentage, a small percentage, were raising, r rising to the top. Um, but I found that the people that were rising to the top were, for, to the large degree, the, the people that were the happiest, the good fathers, they were children that came, that were raised, that had a lot of father involvement. And this is girls are, are suffering from the lack of father involvement too, I found. But they suffer in about, the boys and girls suffer in about 70 different ways uh, from the la lack of father involvement. But the, the girls tend to suffer in slightly different ways and not as severely. Uh, the boys are more likely to commit the suicide, the drug overdoses, the withdrawal, the addiction to video games, the addiction to porn. That's more, those are more boy things. And there's, uh, as I said, 70 major parental nightmares <laughs> that happen. Um, with it, with the boys and girls that don't have the father involvement. Uh, we've divided the lines uh, when it comes to this topic. Uh, if you're a parent and you want to ask our guest questions about his findings and his research, 202-748-8000. All others, 202-748-8001. Uh, when you do your research, and especially as the term is used in the common day, what do you think of the term toxic masculinity, and how does that factor into your research? Yeah, it's very complex, toxic masculinity, meaning that masculinity has a lot of toxicities. But the reason it has a lot of toxicities is not because of male privilege, as is often assumed, but rather because males have historically made sacrifices to risk their, basically, historically, to be a male, you had to be trained to be disposable in that generation's war. And so to be disposable, you had to disconnect from your feelings. You had to say that other people um, you know, serving the country uh, was more important than, than surviving. Um, or you had to be a sole breadwinner in the, in the old days. And so to be a sole breadwinner, you had to do, you had to quit your job as a musician or as a teacher and do what you needed to do to raise your family rather than do what you wanted to do. So instead of it being male privilege, it was really a type of male sacrifice. And so out of that came the toxicities that you had to do to sacrifice yourself. Um, and so now this is the first time in history we have two problems. 
One is we have a purpose void. The old senses of purpose aren't there for boys like they used to be. And that's bad news and good news. Bad news is a purpose void. The good news is that it gives boys an opportunity for a new sense of purpose, to be human beings rather than human doings, as we've always had to be. And so this is an, op an enormous opportunity, but boys that have a purpose void and a dad void don't get directed to be a, to be a, a good role model for their, uh, and their testosterone is often channeled destructively by not being channeled constructively. And those are the boys that are, are mass shooters. Almost all our mass shooters are dad-deprived boys. They're almost all the prisoners are dad-deprived boys. And the ISIS recruits, I found, are usually dad-deprived boys. And, or among the small percentage of ISIS recruits that are girls, they're dad-deprived girls. And so more than, there are 10 causes of the boy crisis, I found, but more than any other single cause um, was, the, was this um, lack of uh, dad involvement. For those categories that you just listed, and what do you yeah. base that research on? Where are you pulling those uh, numbers from? Yes, uh, uh, the research on the um, ISIS recruits was from three female sociologists who uh, studied ISIS recruits. The, uh, the research on the, um, uh, on the mass shooters, it was research I did myself. Um, the research on the, um, uh, on the pri male prisoners from uh, speaking to a lot of judges um, around the country and also when I ran for governor of California, um, I spoke with a lot of prison populations and the administrators were all saying to me, yes, more than 90% uh, dad deprivation. So that dad deprivation, it's the failure of a, some type of imprint of masculinity as seen through a father example pressed onto a boy or put onto a boy? Yeah, really good question. It's both imprint and the and then it's also a lot of the bond, dad style parenting and mom style parenting are very different. So dads are far more likely, for example, to rough house. And, but that rough housing creates a bond. And the rough housing, usually dads are pretty good about when, when say, Johnny um, pokes Jane in the, in the, in the eye with her, his elbow. Uh, dad will say, you know, sorry, end of roughhousing if you, if you do that anymore. But she, dad will usually give the, chi the child a second chance to, to do it well. And when the child gets all caught up in the emotions of the roughhousing and doesn't do it well, then dad will usually say, sorry, no more roughhousing tonight. So the children are learning by the, uh, to think of their sister's or brother's needs because if they don't think of their sister's or brother's needs, they lose the roughhousing. That, so that begins the process of empathy. Um, it also begins the process of knowing when, when am I pushing too much and when is not enough. And so that teaches them the, the balance between being assertive versus being aggressive. So to mom, mom looks at the, at the dad doing the roughhousing and the mom says, you know, God, I feel like I just have one more child to monitor here, you know, and because dads don't know uh, what they're doing that is of value. They don't know that it's leading to empathy. They don't know that it's leading to assertiveness. And they don't know that it's leading to good social skills that lead those children to be able to have more friends, less depression, be more involved. And they also don't know that they're creating through the boundary enforcement, they're creating discipline. And when boys and girls have dreams, but they don't have discipline, those dreams become constant disappointments. And those disappointments lead the, boy and girl, the boys and girls to sort of feel like, I can't really dream again because every time I've dreamt in the past, I've been disappointed and they become very withdrawn and very ashamed of themselves. Uh, the book is The Boy Crisis. It's co-written by our guest Warren Farrell alongside John Gray. You can ask questions again for you parents, 202-748-8000. For all others, 202-748-8000. When we have calls lined up for you, we start in Santa Cruz, California. This is on our parents' line. We'll hear from Yasmina. You're on with our guest. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, a single mom, I, and my my teenage son is is really struggling in a lot of the areas that your book talks about. And almost all the single moms that I know, with the fathers not involved, are having the same thing. So I have a couple of questions. One is, I mean, what is so important about fathers and their role? And, like, what can a single mom do? Yeah, well, all right. There's two very important questions. The dads bring a lot to have what I call a dad-style parenting that is very different from mom-style parenting. There's about seven significant differences. I think the most important of the differences is the boundary enforcement difference. So dads are far more likely, uh, but moms and dads both set boundaries pretty much the same way. Both moms and dads say, sweetie, you can have your ice cream when you finish your peas. 
Uh, children test boundaries the same way. They say, you know, okay, I had a few peas. Can I have my ice cream now? And uh, moms, but the difference is in the way moms and dads tend to enforce boundaries. Moms tend to think, okay, we've had a tough day. Maybe we've divorced. I feel guilty about the divorce. The child doesn't have the father around very much. I'll tell you what, sweetie, have, to, you know, have maybe these 20 more peas, then you can have your ice cream. So the child's able to negotiate a deal. So then the child realizes, okay, I can have the 10 peas, um, and then I'm going to negotiate um, having the ice cream. And mom goes, well, am I gonna really get into a big fight over a few peas um, when it's, you know, um, I don't think so, that's insensitive. Uh, so the child goes away learning that whatever mom says, I can negotiate a better deal. With dad, dad is much more likely to say, um, and sometimes roles are reversed here, dad is more likely to say, you know, the deal is you have to finish your piece. And so, um, you, and the child will go, oh, you're so mean, mom's not like that. And dad would be more likely to go, you can continue whining and there'll be no more ice cream to no tomorrow night or tonight. And so dads tend to, go, so with the, with the dad, the child tends to realize, I have no option but to finish the peas. So what the child is learning with the dad, is postpone gratification. The boundary enforcement that the dad says, you can't manipulate a better deal, leads to postpone gratification. It also leads to, I think, the research that finds that when children are raised predominantly by dads, only 15% have ADHD, whereas children raised predominantly by moms, about 30% have ADHD. And one of the reasons is because the children raised predominantly by moms learn that they don't have to focus their attention on doing what they need to do. They focus their attention on, on doing how to, how to get that better deal. And now the important thing here is that you said, what can single moms do? Single moms, all these things, single moms are very capable of doing. Um, reinterpreting love as giving children those, that boundary enforcement and not allowing them to negotiate a better deal. So balancing off the natural sensitivity that moms tend to have with that greater amount of boundary enforcement is one thing. Uh, second, get the dad involved if that's at all possible. If the dad isn't really you know, driving drunk while the child's in the car, understand that these uh, take a look at the part of the boy crisis that has a, those seven differences and if those between mom style parenting and dad style parenting and if if those differences are helpful for your child's life uh, let the father know that you appreciate those differences in there that they are needed men do whatever they do when they're told they're needed and wanted that's why men would die in war um, just by being told they were a hero because when we were told we were wanted and needed that was we came the second thing is, if you can't, for some reason, get the father, biological father involved, get the child involved in a faith-based community where there's a good male leader, a good imam, a good um, priest, minister, rabbi, and don't only bring the, the male leader in, make sure that that male leader um, is, that, that your choice of a male leader is contingent upon that male leader getting the boys together with other boys, helping them talk about what their fears are and what their feelings are. So boys that feel that they're not alone and isolated are very much enhanced. Second, get, get the children involved in Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts. Uh, they are shown to be very good ways of developing the best of masculinity without the worst of masculinity. Um, get, get the boys involved in a lot of um, sports and activities, not only team sports, but also pick up team sports, uh, where boys have to create their own rules and learn how to negotiate friendships. When the, with all those parenting qualities you listed, why ascribe those to gender? Why can't they be universally present in a mom or a father? They mostly can be. They just don't tend to be. Um, and so, so when, I, when I go around the, the world, I see that mo when I talk about the things I just mentioned, well, moms and dads are all nodding their head yes. Now the good news is that um, there are schools like Urban Dove in New York City uh, where uh, children of very troubled backgrounds are trained by both female and male teachers to do these types of behaviors very early in, in, in life. And so we can train moms to do that boundary enforcement. We can train moms to do, to do the um, roughhousing. Uh, we can train moms to, to develop postponed gratification. And conversely, 
uh, dads can be, um, they can say, okay, if you, you, you fell down on the skis and you're feeling the pressure to join the, the ski team, uh, you don't necessarily have to join the t ski team, uh, something that a mom is more likely to do. So all of these roles, the good news is the roles are able to be adopted by both sexes, but both sexes have to be mindful and conscious of the different qualities that mothers and fathers tend to bring to parenting. Let's hear from Michael in Randallstown, Maryland. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Burrell. Good morning, Pedro. Love your work. Hey, um, so the question I have is um, my wife and I lived in the same home for the first mm, 10 years of, of my daughter's life. And now for the last four years, we're separated. My daughter lives with her mom in Richmond. I live in Baltimore. As my daughter reaches these, her high, she's going into tenth, ninth grade next year. As she goes through this stage of her life, any but top three things that I need to look out for, that I need to try and do, being uh, away, living in Baltimore, her being in, in Virginia. G give me some guidance here. Any yes. Thoughts? First of all, is there any way that you and the mom can figure out a way to get within about 20 miles drive distance from each other? He's already hung up, I'm sorry about that. Oh, oh okay. So if there's a way that you can get, so if there's a divorce or a separation like you're talking about, there's four things that are really helpful. One is that the father and the mother really have about an equal amount of time with the, uh, with the children. Um, children that don't have equal time with the fathers um, and, and the mothers tend to not have the benefits of hangout time. Um, when children, especially boys, when they don't have the benefits of hangout time, uh, they don't express their feelings as fully. It's, it's hangout time when uh, you pick up a kid from um, soccer and you say, how, how did the soccer game go? And most boys will say, okay. Um, but you get around the refrigerator and you're both, he's doing homework and you're just sitting out there hanging out with him. Um, and eventually he says, you know, Dad, you know, if, if, uh, if, the, if the coach had you as a, as a goalie last week, but not this week, why would, it, and you did really well as a goalie last week, you know, why did you, um, you know, why would he ever not have me back the, to be a goalie the next time? And then you start talking about his, and if you're, if you're there listening to him and letting him open up, it's that hangout time that allows him and, the, and, the, and a daughter also to have feelings of being able to share their emotions. Uh, so, so equal amount of time with mom and dad is very important. The second thing that's important is that the child not feel uh, that there's anything that they, that, that they don't hear any bad mouthing from mom to dad or dad to mom. And bad mouthing doesn't just mean words. It means like if the child is saying, I had a great time at mom's, and the dad is going, uh-huh, let's change the subject, or just giving bad body language, the child learns to shut up about the good experiences it has with mom. So no bad mouthing is number two. Number three, that the, ch uh, the mother and father live within about 20 miles from each other, or tw uh, 20 minutes drive time from each other. And the reason for that is that if the children are too far from the other parent, they, they resent missing the activities and the friendships, the parties, and so on um, with, the, with their, their core group of friends, and they don't want to go to the other parent's house, and you don't want to create that type of tension. And the fourth thing is that good studies recently have found that the, the children of divorce who do the best are ones, that have, uh, the, uh, ones whose parents have a significant amount of constant counseling. Uh, by constant, I mean at least once a month, the parents are going to counseling, not just for emergencies, but to, um, to find out the best intent of what the other parent in, um, um, cares about. Michael in Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, I uh, just wanted to first say, uh, Warren, thank you so much for this book. It's um, about a quarter way and it's amazing. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I'm, I'm a high conflict divorce coach in Arizona and I've seen a lot of um, um, trends that are disturbing. Just, just your book is just very enlightening. Um, one of my questions is, when you see these problems in family court, what do you see as the best option? Like when you see a, a mother who is like saying, like, "Oh yes, I want the I want the parents involved. I want the dad involved." It just doesn't come around. But in reality, they're making it so difficult that the um, other parent is not able to to be involved. Yes, it's it's really. Then, I'm sorry. You go ahead. Oh, and then the second one was just um, the, the trend with autism today. Um, 
Do you talk about that in your book? I'm not quite at that portion yet. Um, I talk a little bit about autism, and then John Gray wrote five wonderful chapters on ADHD, um, on, which is, of course, on the autism spectrum, and how to prevent it with natural ways like exercising and different types of foods and um, processes rather than just um, you know, doing the drug, the drug route. Um, but the, so share your first question again. So uh, I am. Oh, he's already is. Oh, okay, very good. So the, yes, the, in high conflict divorces, um, moms are often feeling like, you know, gee, my, I want to have the father more involved, but I let the father be involved last weekend, and um, there was a there was a football game on, and the father let the you know the child go to the playground, and the and the um, and he's quite young, six or seven or eight years of age, and he got beat beat up in the playground. And so, from my perspective, the father cares more about a football game than 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 being there by the child and watching him and and keeping the child safe. What dads have to impart is that they oftentimes have a different way of looking at that. They'd rather have the child go to the playground. They obviously don't want that child to get beaten up. But if the child sort of gets into a scuffle at a playground and comes home, and the dad can say, well, you know, what, what did you notice on that playground that led you to feel that there might be a scuffle? And the, kid, and the, and the son says, well, you know, that one kid pushed me aside at one point or called me a name and they were all swearing or a little bit older, they were all drinking. And so, you know, what do you know to avoid the next time? So the father starts, the father feels it's more important for a child to have an, an experience uh, that is maybe a little bit negative that the child can talk with the dad about um, and learn to prevent themselves from having that experience the next time. The mother will often look at that situation and say that was a neglectful dad. And so, the, so dads and moms have to have good conversations with each other about the different outcomes of the child having the security that moms often give from doing that nurturing and the dads having the, um, the desire for the child to have experiences uh, that it can learn from. Uh, the same type of thing will be true with, um, you know, mom and dad will um, have a child asked to climb a tree, and the, the mom will say, well, maybe in a few years, sweetie, you can climb that tree. Um, and dads will say, well, go ahead and climb the tree, but be careful. But when dads and moms are communicating about it, what I call checks and balance parenting, they start learning to, say, to, to work out compromises that tend to be of benefit to the child. Okay, you can climb the tree, but not this high, not those types of branches, they're too weak. And dad, you have to be out there underneath the tree uh, in case the child does fall, so um, there's some value to that. And dads have to know that climbing that tree does increase the child's IQ, does increase the child's ability to make uh, decisions as to what risks to take and what, not, what risks not to take. Dads have to do reading about the contributions of dad style parenting so they can lovingly explain those contributions to moms so moms just don't think that, that the types of risks that, ch that dads prepare children for are just um, sloppiness or laziness on dad's part. You write about something called gender liberation, just to read you a couple of lines yes. from the book, saying to the degree which our sons become as free as they wish to be as our daughters are is the degree to which we will have taken a huge step. From women's liberation to gender liberation, this requires not a woman's movement blaming men nor a men's movement blaming women, but a gender liberation movement freeing both sexes from the rigid roles of the past toward more flexible for the future. Can yes. you expand on that? Yes, I think one of the great contributions we have uh, look, we, that we're looking forward to is we have this enormous sort of statements about male privilege, male toxicity, and so on. And we have to start seeing that from a boy's point, you know, what is there the best what is the best of what we had in the past? Um, the, the, the willingness to tough it out, the willingness to take risks, the willingness to explore. These are, these are good things that men, that men learned, but taken to their extremes, they all become toxic. Um, and so, uh, and, but in the past, they became toxic because boys learned to be thought of as heroes if they were trained to be willing to die at the age of 18 or so on. And boys learn to give up what they love to do um, to make enough money to support families um, of two, three, four, or five children. 
And to do that, that you can't do things like be a musician. Uh, you have to do, you know, you have to sell insurance nationwide to do those types of things. And so often dads were doing what they didn't love to do. And so these are all, so instead of looking at males as, you know, the future is female, males are toxic, is toxic this is the end of men. You don't speak because you don't, you speak because when you do it's mansplaining. And you, ha you have male pr privilege, we live in a patriarchal world uh, type of thing and you're part of that patriarchy. Uh, that leads our, our sons to not know what to do. You know, do I, do I, um, do I initiate with a girl? And if I do, is, am I going to be a sexual harasser? Am I going to be uh, very cautious and then be called a wimp? Um, and so b there has to be not a hashtag Me Too monologue. There has to be a hashtag Me Too dialogue. We have to train boys and girls in first grade and second grade to communicate, to hear each other's um, pains and hurts and stories and to before the boy responds and says well i have a you know tougher story saying here's what i heard you say um, is there anything else that i'm missing did i distort anything and we have to train parents to communicate in that way almost the boy crisis is a result to a large degree of lack of father involvement. But the lack of father involvement is often as a result of divorce. The divorce is often as a result of bad communication. And so we can train kids to have good communication in school and then have them come home to parents who aren't communicating well at home, otherwise will destabilize the family in a different way. Uh, the children will have no respect for the parents. And so we really have to, if we were to focus on any one single thing, I would, or two, two things, things I'd say is number one, we need to have communication skills training all around the, the world. In Denmark, where they're doing this, it's been very successful. Number two, we ne really need to have a White House counsel on boys and men. Um, a White House counsel on boys and men would say, here is an opportunity. We are saying that boys' issues are a problem and that boys have an opportunity to have less rigid roles, just like girls have had an opportunity to do that. I was on the board of directors of the National Organization for Women in New York City for three years, and I have and always will support a large range of roles for, for, and opportunities for girls, but we need to have the same for boys as well. How did they react to some of these findings, uh, those you served alongside? Yes, um, well and poorly. Uh, they, um, but well in the sense that a, a lot of feminists do um, uh, understand the value of gender liberation. Uh, there is a group um, getting together, um, the largest uh, feminist conference in, in, the, in the world is happening on June 3rd and 4th. And they are talking about uh, a UN study that found that, we, that girls and women will not make progress until boys and men also make progress. I was good friends with Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem for many years. And um, Betty used to, uh, and wrote in, in the second stage, uh, exactly this. And Gloria Steinem used to say, what the world needs is more women at work and more men at home. Um, and we do have to create a world that is, that is liberated enough to be able to have women at home, uh, women at the, in the workplace without any problems um, at high levels, and men uh, to be full-time dads and to be what I call father warriors to overcome the social barriers um, of being ostracized if you're a full-time dad and recognizing that some men are more oriented toward nurturing and are wonderful dads and to know that children brought up by um, men um, predominantly while the mother um, is, is working and coming home, those children grow up extremely well. Uh, and let's hear from Dwayne in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Hey, good morning uh, to you both. Uh, Ms. Morell, I met you at the Marmot Conference uh, a few months back and uh, worked with Julie Baumgartner at First Team's first year in Chattanooga. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Have a dad make a difference uh, program where we bring in, uh, today we'll have about 20 dads. We'll have a few this morning, a few this afternoon. And um, this, in this group, we talk about things that are in this book uh, alongside uh, bringing um, together judges, magistrates, DA, attorney, uh, those that, that deal with uh, visitation and custody, uh, teaching these guys how to get uh, custody versus visitation. I was wondering if you could touch on that a little bit uh, with the 50-50 uh, parenting and the importance of 50-50 parenting versus uh, uh, visitation. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, I, and let me just say this. Um, 
and and just talking, you know, we do some footwork in, in, with this book and and some of the other things that we're trying in our community, and some of you know talking to ladies about this book is just as impactful as talking to men. Uh, I found uh, one young lady said this information is like medicine to me, mm. okay. and uh, you see guys getting houses, you see guys uh, getting uh, uh, their parental rights. And uh, you see guys just stepping up to the plate based on this information uh, that they're getting uh, through uh, our organization and your book. Dwayne, thank you. We'll let our guests respond. Yeah, it's, um, I, I'd say of the four things that are really essential if there's a divorce or a, um, or a children growing up well, um, of those four things, the, the parenting time, um, an equal amount of time with father and mother is so important. And while you know this, this should be you know Kentucky is the only state that really has this now, um, and other states are moving toward that as they're seeing that the children that do best are the ones that have a significant amount of father involvement afterwards. As I said at the outset of the program, girls do suffer a lot for, in 70 different areas, as well as boys suffering in 70 different areas when they don't have that father involvement. Um, but girls suffer less intensely. Boys often feel abandoned and rejected. Um, but there's also so much that the father involvement tends to bring. Uh, so dads will tend to um, make the, I was saying before about making the boundaries uh, um, very strict. So moms will set bound, uh, bedtimes at an earlier time. Dads will set bedtimes at a later time. But, but the studies show that children actually get to bed earlier with the dads. Um, because the dads will, if they, if the children don't get everything done that they need to get done, like their teeth brushed and their homework done, dads will say, "You lose your reading time. You lose the fun time." Um, and but so, and the and the dad will tend to be able to do things like have a lot of fun with the child before the child goes to bed, and moms will tend to go, "Wait a minute, you can't sidetrack the child um, into um, into having roughhousing before the child goes to bed. You'll get the child all excited." But in fact, the data does not show that that's true. Uh, the, 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 the child that focuses on knowing that it's going to have some fun before it goes to bed is able to get the homework done, get the things done that it needs to do. So what the, the main thing that needs to happen is that dads need to do their homework and, and understand why they're valuable. The second thing that needs to happen is there needs to be an, a new change in the culture. Just as we said 50 years ago or so, uh, that we want and need women in the workplace. We need not just physical beings called women. We need women in the workplace because their values, their orientation, some of their skill sets will tend to be different. And that when we have men and women together in the workplace, there'll be uh, an optimal outcome for that. Uh, the same thing is true with dads at home. And so the, the, the fighting, the, one of the most important fights we can do in this country is fighting for there to be father involvement in every family and to and when there absolutely cannot be uh, for there to be um, father very good stepfathering uh, very good um, boy scouts cub scouts faith-based communities um, other males to be involved but the the different i i i was a, i'm a stepdad um, to two daughters and I, I felt that I would be just, just fine as a stepdad. The research did not prove, I mean, I think I have been a good stepdad, uh, but, I, uh, but it, the children really have a biological attachment to their, their father that needs to be, and if, if anything that I did when I started doing the research for the boy crisis that was positive, it was to uh, inspire the biological father to be more involved with the child and he was more involved with the child as he as he was told that he was needed and that he was wanted and that's you know we we have to remember that throughout history when we told men they were needed in the in that generation's war men were willing to die to do what they were needed to do and and that's what we the message we need to be giving to fathers now the boy crisis why our boys are struggling and what we can do about it co-written by our guest Warren Farrell and John Gray uh, Men from Mars, women, women are from Venus. Venus. Yes, yeah. Exactly. Uh, so that's a topic of our discussion for the next half hour. For parents, 202 748 8000. For all others, 202 748 8001. We'll go next to Detroit, Michigan. David, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Pedro and Mr. Farrell. I really I, I am going to uh, find that book. I'm going to read it. One thing I want to say 
but you said you hit it on a uh, you hit upon a number of different issues that I had always thought about. One, because I believe I think that uh, as as a rule, boys are pack animals, and we cleave to uh, being in um, in 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 teams and packs, and so that's why I believe in order for us as an antidote, in my in my opinion, is that the more boys that are included in some type of sport in, 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 in junior high or high school will make the difference be, between them going off and, and finding games and, and other uh, uh, antisocial behavior. So what do you think about that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, sports are really, a, first of all, a father is very important because in the old, there's, there's a purpose for it that I talked about at the outset of the show of boys not having their old sense of purpose. And if you have a boy, if you have a purpose void and a dad void combined, boys have no place to channel their testosterone. So their testosterone tends to get channeled destructively. Um, if you go from a, a female only home to a female only school, um, boys have no male role models that are constructive, which was a lot of wh where you were headed there um, and what you were saying. And so we need one of the things we need to do is to make sure that there are significant, at least equal numbers of male teachers and that the type of male teachers that there are are not just imitation female male teachers, but males who are more traditional males, males who are softer males, so that the boys who are growing up have a whole spectrum of males uh, that they can identify with just as girls who are growing Growing up, have a whole spectrum of females, and so that's uh, one thing that we can happen to help boys not go from female-only schools to fem female-only homes to female-only schools, and then wonder why they get attracted to a drug dealer or a gang leader in a, in a destructive type of way. And so you're you're absolutely right. Um, the, the the father involvement and the and oh, the sports is what you mentioned. Uh, sports is very important, uh, not only for boys but also for girls. And we often, and there's three types of sports that are what I call in the Boy Crisis book the liberal arts of sports that are really very important for your child to master. One is individual sports like gymnastics, the other, even though there's a team element to it. Number two is team sports like soccer and volleyball and so on. Number three is pickup team sports. Pickup team sports, as we've been worried about children being safe have gotten dropped out of our culture. And that's a very important part of the process of training our sons and daughters to be entrepreneurs. We need to encourage our daughters also to be in pickup team sports because um, girls oftentimes don't take the risks as easily as boys take. They don't start things um, from, z from zero. And pickup team sports teaches you to go up to somebody that you don't know and say, do you want to join me in, say, basketball? And, you know, if so, do we play a full court or half court? And, you know, are you a type of person who doesn't want any fouling to happen at all? Um, and, you know, are you the type of person that says, oh, throw me the ball um, just because you want to take the shot and you want to hog it all to yourself? There's so many things you learn when somebody is not supervising you with a set of rules and you have to discover the rules by yourself. This is perfect preparation for being an entrepreneur. Um, team sports is very good preparation for being a corporate player or a, a player in an organization. And individual team sports is wonderful for, for self-starting. So take a read about the functions of each of these and then talk, moms and dads should be talking together about how they are going to require their children to be involved in these. When I was a, a step parent to my very younger children, um, I wanted to get them involved in soccer and um, the children did not want to get involved in soccer. And um, the, the mom was, uh, the woman who's now my wife, um, said, well, you know, they shouldn't have to get involved in soccer if they don't want to. And my response was very different. I said, no, this is, we, we, we as parents need to require them to get involved in soccer. Uh, we don't, they don't have to do it forever, um, but at least to try it for a year and, you know, or whatever activity they wanted to, that was a team sport. And so it's this type of checks and balance parenting uh, that requires good communication and both mother and father to not respond to a different suggestion by the other parent as criticism and then become defensive. So, you know, if I were to encourage parents to do one thing, it would be to take couples communication courses to be able to hear personal criticism without becoming defensive. That is the single biggest Achilles heel of all human beings, what leads to more divorces, which leads to the boy crisis um, more than any other single thing except lack of father involvement. Let's hear from Gwen in Detroit, Michigan. 
Hi, uh, thanks for having me. And um, thank you, Dr. Mr. Ferrell, for coming on. Um, what I wanted to say is I, I was listening to you, and everything makes sense. And then at first I was thinking, well, a lot of single women who have raised um, boys or who have college and have made something of themselves, you know, and I felt that I was successful. Um, my mother died when I was years old. My father raised five kids. I married um, boys. I graduated from high school and married and then divorced. We had two small children, and I decided to go back to school. That was incredible. My father did nurture me and give me confidence and everything, and um, then my children got in trouble, like with uh, they wasn't on, um, they did uh, have their own families now, oh, and, but my daughter, uh, she married, and her husband uh, divorced, they divorced, but they were still young, she had three children, but he was not as supportive. It was like he was trying to, that made her, you know, and I encourage her that she can, can do well, there's lots of children raised by about the fathers. But just yesterday, she was uh, in tears, and she was telling me that her son didn't want to go to graduation at this alternative school. He really wanted to go to his regular high school. And um, anyway, what I'm saying is he has been in a lot of trouble. Yes. My grandson, her youngest child, the other two have, one is in college, the other one is the way lives on his own, but um, um, the youngest one, he has been troubled. He has been in trouble. It's been a struggle with him, you know, and his father, you know, just doesn't want to interact. So he puts, you know, puts that wall up if things is not right. But at the same time, he's long building his life, moving from house to house, and now, you know, he's got... Gwen, uh, Gwen, no, for, oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Gwen. Appreciate the the comment. Uh, we'll let our guests respond to that. Uh, yeah, the, the uh, what you're saying is a very, very common pattern. As as I I think you've already heard me say, um, I, the most important single thing that fathers need to hear is uh, so so many fathers. What they tell me is, you know, I feel like uh, when I do things my way, I'm criticized for doing it by my way. Um, it's, you know, like I'm too tough on the child because, you know, with so boundary enforcement is often interpreted as being too tough on the child um, or the rough housing is, you know, too rough on the child having different risks or the father will want to take the child camping and, and the camping is perfectly fine about the child going longer distances than the mother would feel comfortable with and sometimes the child will get lost or will in, the, in that longer distance um, hurt himself or herself. And then the, that proves to the mother, quote unquote proves, uh, that, that, that that really is a neglectful father. And so dads really need to share with moms the important, and know the value of those things, share that with moms. But moms, if you want a biological dad involved, you need to value him. You need to know how much men respond to being needed and especially by the woman that they love. Uh, there's nothing that's more, that drives men more than hearing how they are needed. And if a man feels that each time he does something with the child, he's criticized for it or uh, told he's endangering the child, what he'll do is he'll go off and earn money um, because earning money is, he knows that you'll want the money, uh, everybody will want the money, a new woman in his life if he's divorced uh, will want the money. And, he, and he's, so he's learned that um, he's more valued as a human doing than he is as a human being translated into a parent. And so that's a whole cultural message that we have to, to send that is very different than the cultural message we've been sending. But each individual mom needs to focus on um, honing that message of knowing that, you know, if, if we told men um, that they will be loved and they will ha we will have sex with them if they, are, um, if they are walking on their hands, men would be having hand-walking contests tomorrow. 
women need to know how powerful their messages are um, to men, just like women oftentimes put a lot of makeup on because uh, you know, they try to lose weight because they feel that men want thinner women who look a certain way. Uh, well, you know as a woman how much you respond to messages that you feel will give you love, approval, and affection and attention. And men are the same way. Here is Liz. She's in Mill Valley, California. Good morning. Good morning, Pedro. I'm really enjoying your show. Uh, I have a question about for um, for Warren Farrell about the coalition to create a White House Council on Boys and Men. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what that what that is and how, what you're doing with it today? Yes, actually, it's funny you should ask that because. I originally was contacted by the Obama administration to be an advisor to the White House Council on Women and Girls. That never actually ended up manifesting, but my resp and I said, of course, yes. Um, but I, I also felt that um, it was important to have a White House Council on Boys and Men. So I st and so the response of the White House at the time was to, um, you know, create a proposal and to s send it up to President Obama. Uh, we did that. It, got, it stopped just short of President Obama, but we're still fighting today, uh, uh, 10 years later, to have a White House Council on um, men and boys because there's uh, v almost no government commissions that are saying to the country, um, you know, boys and men are having problems. And they're having problems that are particularly egregious here in the United States. Um, here in the United States, we've cut back on things that help boys succeed, like vocational education, like recess. Um, like um, permission to sort of be a, a bit more rough with each other. And so, um, and, and the most important thing is we need to put the fact that boys are having so many problems on the national agenda. We need, and this can be done with an executive order by the president. And so, um, and so once you put it on the national agenda, whether you're a private association of psychologists or um, an organization uh, that, that is uh, a public service organization, you're likely to have your next conference about it, your next conference on psychology about what is the psychology of boys and men as opposed to women and girls and how can they be melded? How can we move to a gender liberation movement where both sexes' stories are heard? Um, up until now, as um, you may have heard, I was on the board of directors of the National Organization for Women in New York City, and what we were very good at is we, we shared how the, the, the feminist experience of female powerlessness and the feminist experience of male power. But no one to this date has shared the male experience of male powerlessness and the male experience of female power. And that whole, so we haven't taken a binoculars to the other half of the, of the gender dialogue. And so that's what I'm asking that we put on the agenda of the nation um, in the next um, 10, 15 years so that we can have a, a true gender liberation movement encouraging both sexes to be free from the rigid roles of the past and to more flexible, caring roles of the future that allow each boy and girl to discover who she, his or her unique self uh, so that they can have that unique self um, be nurtured by both mothers and fathers. What would you say about this issue to same-sex couples with children? Yeah, it's so important. First of all, we don't have great data on how same-sex couples with children will turn out. So we need, and, and the reason for that is we either have data from um, uh, very feminist-oriented and, and same-sex couple-oriented populations or very conservative organizations that each ask questions <laughs> that, that create answers that are sort of predestined. Um, and, the, and also, we haven't had a large enough number of same-sex couples raise children that, are, ha that have grown old enough uh, to know exactly how they've turned out. So the data is imperfect in that area. However, there is a huge amount of encouragement that comes from same-sex couples having an opportunity to, they've oftentimes um, had a lot of cultural biases to, um, to, to resist and overcome. And they're very good at being able to chill, help their children overcome a lot of those cultural biases. So, um, and so there's a lot of hope in that, um, in, in children being raised by same-sex couples. But they do have to make sure that their attitude toward males, uh, especially if um, is, is positive, uh, rather than um, rather than uh, a negative one. Here is Aisha in Capitol Heights, Maryland. Hi. Hi. Good morning, Pedro. Um, your last question actually uh, touched on my question. Um, 
my wife and I are raising an 11 month old son. Um, just as background, I was raised predominantly by a single father. I went to my mom's on the weekends. They had a great co-parenting relationship. Um, and I, I definitely saw the, the differences in their parenting styles um, that your guest has mentioned. Um, so, you know, as, as we're raising the son and we both have sisters, we don't have brothers, um, we're just trying to figure out how to move forward. We, we feel that maybe some faith-based options might not not fairly be available to us um, as far as developing male role models for him. But we're just wondering, you know, how as two moms we can best raise our son. Yes, very good. Uh, first, take a look at the sections in the Boy Crisis book where I talk about the differences in dad style parenting versus mom style parenting and, and, and immerse yourselves um, in the uh, balancing out the what might be natural to you and uh, versus getting ma making sure your son you know is encouraged to do that pick up team sports make sure your son um, it get, gets involved in Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts Cub Scouts have a lot of data on um, character development being very positive among uh, Cub Scouts versus control groups of equivalent boys from equivalent boy uh, backgrounds that did not have an immersion in Cub Scouts um, if, if the faith, so the faith-based community is not appropriate for you, but the faith-based community, don't push that aside um, automatically. Um, but if, if you do get the son involved, your son involved in faith-based communities growing up, make sure that there's, um, that, the, that the most important part of faith-based communities is your son being involved with other boys his own age as he grows older, so that as boys tend to cut their feelings off, um, as they do as, as puberty uh, approaches, um, that, that, that they see that there's other boys that are going through the same experiences that they are going through. That's one of the great preventers of, of drug use and drug abuse and withdrawal into video game addiction and, and into porn um, as a boy gets into to puberty. But in, in the ages where you are now, make sure that, the ch that your child cannot rule. That is, that when, when you say that she or he, that he uh, needs to eat the peas um, before they get the ice cream, that they, that in fact, that the child does not manipulate better deals with you. Um, that, you know, and that the terrible twos don't mean that, uh, that you're tending to give in to your child in order to keep your child quiet. And make sure your child is getting responses on your part that rewards his good behavior as opposed to reward, reward him when he, when he creates those tantrums. What do you see with the rise of mobile technology and how it's impacting parenting? Uh, yes, uh, when parents when parents come up to me and they say, you know, um, you, you talk, Dr. Farrell, about family dinner night being so important, and the first rule you say is, you know, get rid of electronics at the table. Well, I can't. My children want those electronics at the table. When I hear that, I know that, that we have a problem, and the problem is that the children are controlling the parents, not the parents controlling the children. Uh, there are so many leverages that many parents don't realize they have, and leverage number one is, you know, saying very clearly, um, there can be no electronics at the dinner table. The dinner table is time for you to learn the skills of communicating with the family members where we are what's going to be with you for the rest of your life. Oh, you're, you're, there's, there's a big problem with that? Okay, you can just give me the, um, you know, the, the electronics now and they will be put somewhere until you learn that lesson. Um, oh, you're really uh, complaining about that a great deal? Um, we can also cut off the access to, um, you know, to, any, to anything that we're paying for related to that, that, that game. Oh, you, you're, you're going into your computer, you want the computer um, to have the door closed? Fine, we'll take the computer out of the room, we'll put it into the main room. You can be on the computer, but we'll watch what you're doing on the computer. Seems like you've had this conversation. Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> You know, parents being parents, there's a reason we're parents. And, um, and when children feel, when chil here's the really fascinating thing, is when children don't feel the boundaries, they're like walking in the dark without knowing where the end of the, uh, of the cliff is. And they feel very insecure. Um, the children that do so much better are ones that feel that their parents care enough to have boundaries that give them that discipline, and then they start doing better with that discipline. They start doing better in school. Uh, they start having less ADHD, and then they, they, they find that teachers feel proud of them. Um, their peers respect them more. For boys, this is amazingly important because when it gets to be boy-girl time, uh, girls are not very interested in dating losers. 
Uh, they date men who are good performers. And, um, and so when boys do not have the discipline to perform well, um, they find that they are um, girl deprived and they start turning to porn and porn, <coughs> porn addicts the brain um, to having dopamine when you have more and more excitement. And then when you get a real girl in your life, the girl feels like she's just an object of the, of the porn and she withdraws, which only convinces the boy that he's not worthy of the girl and then he goes back to porn. One of the criticisms of your book comes from Focus on the Family's Glenn Stan. He wrote a piece for the Federalists that says part in this. What is clearly missing is what should be central, the larger vision for what boyhood and thus manhood really is and how we put our boys on the path towards that ideal. He offers no meaningful for what way of, for what mothers, fathers, grandparents, teachers, coaches, scout leaders, and all the other players who affect a boy's proper development should shoot for. This is the book's greatest fault. Yeah, I would so, so totally disagree with that because um, that reviewer is coming from a place where boys need to be boys. It's, um, and, you know, and girls need to be girls and never the two shall meet. And in fact, I feel that um, there are boys that we need to reward for being like boys and we need to teach them how some of those skills, um, like being able to tough things out and being able to take risks and so on are necessary. But, but there's a large variety of boys that are born uh, with many different characteristics. And our job as parents is not to create boys to wear straight jackets of masculinity um, or to teach boys to be like girls, it's to discover who they are and how it makes them prosper and what makes their personality <laughs> develop. You know, one of the one <coughs> wonderful things that anyone who's had a parent of multiple children knows is that, you know, each child, you know, when you're just a few months old, uh, you begin to see a child's different personality. And your job is to do, as a parent, to, to help that child's personality be supported, but at the same time, watch for where that personality becomes destructive, because every virtue taken to its extreme becomes a vice. And to us, a soft, loving boy is wonderful, but if he's always soft and loving and doesn't know how to stand up for himself, problem. And the, the reverse is also true. Having a certain amount of fear um, is healthy, but having too much fear is, is stymies oneself. And so I feel that um, the message that I was trying to say in the Boy Crisis book of, you know, of both parents having to nurture the unique self of each child, um, but that without the father around, a boy doesn't have somebody to nurture um, him toward uh, the healthiest adult possible. Um, I felt he missed that point. Uh, this is from Roger in New York. Roger, we're running a little short on time, so go right ahead. Good morning, Dr. Farrell. Thank you very much for your book and the other work that you're doing. Thank you. My question has to do with our local problems uh, in our school district, um, primarily with boys, but also with girls, uh, and that is bullying. Uh, it's turned out that bullying is a big issue here, um, and the, um, the recourse that these young men take when they encounter somebody that they don't like or they don't care for um, is to be very um, belligerent. And finally, the fallback is to say that this is their patriotic duty to make these other students who are not of our culture feel unwelcome. Yes, absolutely. Bullying is a, is a huge issue. So the number one, um, there's, there's two basic preventers for bullying. One is, um, is having those communication training courses in first and second grade where everyone in the class can, can begin to see the person, everyone, in, everyone else in that class as a full human being. Basically, Bullying is a way, you, in order to bully, you have to objectify what you're bullying. You can't see that person as a full feeling human being. And, and, and bullying, of course, comes from your own internal security uh, that you need to sort of prove yourself better than somebody else and you pick on somebody to, to prove that. Second, we know that there's a much, much less bullying. One of the greatest preventers of bullying is having a significant amount of father involvement where the boy um, is able to develop his own sense of self-esteem and being able to develop his own sense of competence. The bullies and the people who are bullied are very similar in personality types. They are both people of low self-esteem, uh, people who often do not do well in school, um, they, um, and they both often feel like victims of different sorts, but the bully will never admit it, uh, whereas the bu bullied often does. Um, so the, the solution to bullying is not just to punish the bully, 
the solution to, the bu to bullying is to help the boys and girls in first and second, third, fourth grade uh, to be able to hear each other's story, respect each other's perspective, discover each other as human beings. This isn't just theory. Um, in Denmark, where they are doing much more of this, which is the, the country that is the most advanced in having early childhood communication training, um, bullying has dropped very precipitously. Um, and so that's, I'd say, the, the, the number one thing schools can do. Number two things that schools can do is to get, um, get many more male teachers um, so that the te that boys that don't have fathers can have good, strong role models of you don't bully, you're not allowed to bully, What's the ma uh, and to talk about why you feel you need to be a bully uh, so that the, because we see that the, those strong male vo role models are much more likely to be associated with a decrease in bullying. Uh, the book is called The Boy Crisis. It is co-written by Warren Farrell and John Gray. Uh, if you want to find out more about the work, the guest has a website. Also, with the commission to create a White House Council on Boys to Men, whitehouseboysmen.org is the website. Warren Farrell joining us for this conversation. Thanks for your time today. It's been a total pleasure to be with you. If you